Hey guys, it's Sebastian from Ask Sebi, and today we are going to talk about a bunch of optimization mistakes that I've been seeing people who are new to the game make. So again, this isn't really the basic stuff. It's not like people forgetting to pay off their cards or overusing it. That's not really what we're talking about. We're more so talking about advanced strategies. One of the big problems with this channel is that I do talk about a lot of different things. So I talk about Credit 101 topics as well as more advanced topics. So the main problem is when people who are kind of in the 101 stage trying to apply the advanced tactics. This leads to the first example, combining hard inquiries. So again, we did a whole other video talking about when you would want to combine hard inquiries, the benefits of it, and the too long didn't watch is that by combining for two or more cards on the same day from the same issuer, then it's only going to be one hard inquiry instead of two. This is really beneficial if you have really big expenses coming up. So if you're doing a renovation for $10,000 and you're going to have that spend anyways, you might as well get those two cards now just because you're going to hit the spend. If you're someone in the mid game, let's say you have five cards already and you have one to two years of credit life in terms of average of account, then that's going to be fine because that's not really that weird. Again, look at it from the bank's end. That seems kind of interesting, but it's not unreasonable. But on the flip side, if you had someone who is very thin file, maybe they only have one card or maybe they have six months of history or no history at all, them applying for two cards at the same time, that looks very risky. The main reason is because at that point, it looks like you're credit seeking. They don't really know how to grade you yet. They don't know the experience with you, whether you're good of credit or not. So doing something like that just looks really bad. Again, I've kind of seen this in two instances, the person who has no credit history applying for two starter cards instead of a student card or a secured card. Again, you're going to run into problems from the same issuer or the people who have one year of history and then they're moving on to Chase and then they're being very aggressive of Chase. So maybe getting the Chase Sapphire Reserve as well as the Freedom card as their first two Chase cards. Mistake number two is related to this example and it's people who have relatively thin credit files going for relatively high tier cards. Again, let's say you're that person who has one year of history on their card, and now you're after your first Chase card because you want to optimize 524, and you're going for the Chase Sapphire Reserve. Chase has a really hard time giving you the reserve because the minimum starting limit is $10,000. So with a lot of the other cards, they can give you $500 or $1,000 or $2,000 to see how you can handle that first before we're giving you a high limit. So for them, that's a relatively low risk. If you default, if you run away with the money, $500, it sucks for them, but it's not that bad. But $10,000, that's a pretty big limit. Given that you're a fin file, given that they don't have any history with you, it's just really hard for them to give you such a high limit unless there is any other specific reason that makes sense. For most people, again, I'd recommend starting from a Freedom or Freedom Unlimited and working your way up, but it really depends on your circumstances. So the reason I say that is because there are some people who have significant amount of funds with Chase who can still end up getting approved for the Chase Sapphire Reserve. These tend to be expats, so people who are new to the country, maybe they're working in Singapore or India or London or somewhere else and moving here, so they have substantial amounts of money and it looks safer for Chase's end. In the past, the recommended number here was about $10,000 to $15,000, but again, I'm not sure whether that is still true or whether that number has increased. But logically speaking, I'm pretty sure if you were Chase private clients, if you had $250,000 in that account or among your investment accounts of Chase, they're not going to have a hard time approving you for some of those cards. On kind of a similar note, high income also plays a role. So again, I have seen some people who are coming out of school for investment banking or consulting who are making, let's say, 150 or 200K, and they're still eligible to get this card, even though it's their first Chase card. And again, they might have had one or two other cards to build experience to kind of show it off, but then they're going for the high tier Chase card because their income is sufficient enough for Chase to take that risk. I wouldn't be surprised if the profession that you list on your application also plays a role. But again, all of this information is kind of proprietary on their end, so we don't really know what goes into the algorithm. The third mistake that I've seen people make is not optimizing 524 and then realizing it a bit too late. So again, maybe you hate Chase, so move on, go to someone else, that's fine. But there's a lot of people who end up adding too many cards, making it difficult to build out that trifecta or maybe to get Selfless Companion Pass or get the Marriott card or whatever else that makes sense given your setup that you want to build long term. Again, these people fill out consultations. Sometimes I'll actually recommend the 524 cards first, but instead they'll go for other cards and then afterwards realize that, oh, I'm locked out of Chase for two years. 
And again, the thing is, Chase isn't the end all and be all. You might still move on from Chase after getting the trifecta, but it's still easier to get that first, and then you can choose to do something else later. If we use an analogy, imagine you were at a buffet and there is prime rib, but it's running out. So let's say they stop serving it at a certain amount of time. So yes, you can go after other food first, but that's always still going to be available there. You might as well get the prime rib first. If you don't like it, maybe finish half of it and then toss it or just leave it there. But if you don't get that prime rib, you're going to lose out on it. So for me, I'm trying to optimize decisions that minimize my long-term regrets. And again, I can always flip around afterwards and go for other stuff. And again, similar to what I said initially, if you hate prime rib, if you hate beef, if you don't eat that, then that's fine, skip it. You already know yourself better than I do. Moving on to number four, which is related to number three, but again, I've seen enough people do it, is getting the Uber card. So there's a lot of people who end up getting the Uber card while they're still under 524 and realize afterwards that, oh, they should have gotten the Chase Sapphire Preferred or the Reserve for the sign-up bonus for the similar multipliers. And then afterwards, if they realize that they don't want to pay the annual fee for the Reserve long-term, they can always downgrade it. But then by getting the Uber card, they're locked out of Chase. Again, the card is not bad, it's a good card, there's a lot of reasons to get it, but I feel like if you are in that earlier stage, you just want to play the game right because there's not that many outs with that Uber card. The next one is going to be that people who are new to the game are very adverse to paying annual fees. And again, I kind of get the idea because I was in the same boat when I started, but I would recommend that you sit down, spend five minutes, and crunch the numbers. Let's run through a quick example. So let's say we flip a coin, I think from Taiwan, and if it's heads, I give you $100. If it's tails, you give me $75. It's a fair coin, there's nothing weird going on, and also you don't rely on the money, so it's a nice to have rather than you need it to pay off, let's say your rents, or to have food for the next few days. Would you agree to that deal? So again, there's some people who will be like, no, because I can lose $75 for no reason. But if you look at it mathematically, if you look at the expected value of the situation, it's very optimal for you to take that deal because you have a positive expected value. The reason we use that example is because I think a lot of people just see the negative number and they don't spend the time crunching the numbers to realize that, yes, they actually get more value. By picking that card with an annual fee, by paying, let's say, the $100, they're actually getting $200 more in value. One of the big points of this channel isn't really to tell you what to do, it's to help you think about things a bit differently. So again, giving you the tools to learn how to fish rather than telling you where to go fish. The final mistake that I've seen people make is people being a bit too aggressive in too short of a period. So again, I think look at it from the situation of how a bank would look at it. If there's one person who has a relatively short history going for five cards in three months, that looks kind of risky. But if you do pace it out, I think it's fine. And again, this one's arguable depending on what your strategy is, depending on how you want to play it, but also I just want to help you guys maximize your approval rates. So I hope that was helpful, and let me know if you guys have any questions. My question for you guys is, are there any other mistakes that you've seen people make, or that you've made yourself, and that you want to share with other people? Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, it really helps us out. And if you know anyone else who benefit from what we just talked about, feel free to share this video with them, because it's probably going to help them out. By the way, I hope you guys liked it. See you guys next time.